thank you for being able to to share that. Um, and the the women, the people of Congo, is why we are here uh, during this hour. Um, so I just I want to welcome everyone. Um, my name is. Amber Mays, I work for Candles Holocaust Museum and the Jewish Federation of Greater Indianapolis, both of which are located in Indiana. Um, the Democratic Republic of Congo is, you know, it sits right in the heart of Africa and in many ways contains its heart. Um, but it has been embroiled in violence for decades. Uh, since 1996, the, the DRC has, um, the violence has left more than 6 million people dead, making it the deadliest conflict since World War II. Uh, corrupt officials, militias, neighboring countries, and interna international corporations all scramble to control its many natural resources, leaving everyday Congolese citizens caught in the middle. Um, hundreds of villager, villages have been razed to the ground. Five million have been displaced from their homes. Tens of thousands of women and girls have been raped by armed groups, as well as by soldiers in the Congolese army. Uh, thousands of young boys and girls have been forcibly recruited to serve as soldiers in the militias or used as sex slaves. Um, so I'm, I'm very honored to be joined today by some truly inspiring individuals that have dedicated their lives to improving the lives of those living in the Congo and shining a light um, on their voices. Um, so I just want to quickly introduce um, everybody. If you could just quickly say uh, hello, your name when I call on you and what organization you're with, that would be fantastic. So is, do I have Ali? Yes, hello, this is Ali Mulumba uh, from Congo. Uh, I'm working with Congo American Bridge and also working with uh, Exodus Refugee Migration a resentment uh, organization based here in Indianapolis. I've been here for seven years. And uh, uh, from Congo, I used to be a former director of uh, Youth Great Lake. It is a no profit organization based in Coma. I've been working for 12 years in uh, Coma, Rwanda, Burundi, and Uganda. Thank you, Ali. Uh, Sandra. Hi, I'm Sandra Gorday. And I am a member of the uh, Congo American Bridge Board located in Indianapolis, Indiana. I worked in the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo in the Equator region for 18 years as a mission co-worker and later served as an executive for Africa with the Christian Church Disciples of Christ and the United Church of Christ, two mainline churches working in partnership with several organizations in the DRC. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, Anna. Hi, my name is Anna Tembo. I'm a friend of Naima. Um, her organization is Women Rising. I'm a survivor of, of the genocide in Congo and excited to be here with everybody. Thanks, Anna. Uh, Stani. Yes, uh, my name is Stani Zabarinda. I'm from Congo and I live in the United States for now three, three years. Um, here in the United States, I'm working with a refugee resettlement organization called Lutheran Family Services. But back in Congo, I was do, uh, working with a nonprofit organization. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're missing just a couple, but we're going to just plug on. Um, so last but not, certainly not 
not least, uh, Nama, if you could please introduce yourself and then um, tell us a little bit about what's occurring in the Congo and what motivated you to get involved. The Congo in a province called South Kivu province. Why I'm joining this event today is uh, I initiated that petition for to bring little light of those women who get courage. I'm honored really to be one of those women who get the courage to go on, <clears throat> sorry, on a road to manifesting this kind to show world how they are dying. This is like not 1% because women every from maybe two decades now, violent women from time colonizing. That is kind of where we are still today. We are saying never again, but we still inside that atrocity, violence, massacre from north, south, west, east. For example, if we can say Butembo, if we can say Ituri, when you can say Minembe, Uvira, Fizi, is those women, they are really my heroes to stand up, to say no, we need the security, is why today I remember them. And I think we've got to talk about more. Thank you. That is why I'm here. And what, Nema, what kind of, um, if you could give just a little bit of background to, to your story, um, how did you decide that you were going to be this one woman, can, you know, um, champion for women's rights as well as the rights of, of the disabled in the Congo? Oh, that is a too long story. The lady <laughs> about the, uh, I think when the people talking about atrocity or how I become activist or how I become a peacemaker, all my life, I really like peaceful. And I don't like it to go away if I see something is not going well. And they say, how, why? I have a purpose to get where I am and how I can be simple instrument to be used to bring the peace. Because the enemy, people who work, who bring trouble, who bring war, they work so hard. They make all those guns, all those instruments they are using. But for me, I'm here to build, to do like some instrument to bring that light to those kind of. Because other people who speak before us speaking about some ignorance. Ignorance is not the answer. But how to be this uh, genocide or this uh, 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 racism, this divisionism, this colonized mind, this is really the killing world, is why I stand up and say, how we can fight, how I can maybe influence 10 girls, 10 boys, begin talking about not to hate. This is like a cancer, but people don't have a really medicine. You know, this cover uh, coronavirus, a whole world is stand up fighting with that coronavirus. But I think coronavirus is not a big deal, like we have a genocide. And people forget, we, people, everyone put eyes on the coronavirus. This is the simple things we can do. It's really, really simple to stay social distance. It's only the request to us to be clean. But this uh, genocide, atrocity, war, this division, this kind of, kind of around the world, the people that are planting those seeds, but we are here to plant peace, hope on those people. If the decision maker can maybe Hear those voices crying, those kids dying from Second World War until today. We are fighting, but no one who hear women really. Women, they are some, sometimes I was on, on uh, South Korea two years ago. I've been in South Korea many times to protest for women's survival, sexual abuse during Second World War with the Japanese. 
and no, still today, no peace. But still today is going on in Congo, no one who hear us. UN, we do this petition, but UN is not, is no eyes to hear, no eyes to hear these kids who are crying, who hide die hunger, without shelter, without water. And how we are going, how African country or Congolese countries is going to fight with coronavirus. And they are not at home. They don't have water. They don't have food. Women have a baby outside. This is really, we are walking, we are calling everyone, please, hearing women's voice. It's not only women from Minembe. No, whole Congo. Go, for example, Beni. Women dying with babies in womb, going in Ituri, going everywhere. That is not a politician. We are not talking because we want to get position. Please, we are working about life. And this is not really easy for us. We are not working to say, I want to be president. I want to be parliament. Is the people who are in position, who are giving this, who are planting this seed, hurting. Women, they are not crying to say, oh, we want to have the position. But we are crying, we need peace. We need peace in DRC. We need peace. Only that. If they can stop it to, to bring us guns, grenades, all those stuff. In Africa, we don't have like a, a industry to make those guns. And where we don't have, you know, Minembe, we can't, we don't have a road. We don't have a, an airplane when it can go. We don't have a medicine. Kids, they can't go to school, but they have a guns. They have grenades. They have all these things to kill people, but we can't have a medicine. We can't have water. We can't have education, but we have a guns. And I, I'm asking today, I'm asking, I ask you all, please, how, where they can, they, they, they stop to bring us guns, grenades, they can bring us medicine, water. It's only that we bring, we, we want to, they can bring. It's, it's, you know, this photo around me, this is my cousin who passed away beginning that war. His name is Patrick Dudu. He's my cousin who passed away in Fizi. Maybe Stanley will tell how. I have like thousands of names and photos, but we don't have the time right now, but I'm really honored. Everyone who passed away in a bad way. Anyway, we are, we are, we are going, always going, we are going to pass away, but really, really, I ask, please, Plant the seed of hope and peace and love. And we can be living anyway. Everyone will pass away, but in a good way. Please join us planting the seed and talk about the peace in DRC. Thank you. Neva, um, I don't even know how to follow that up. That, um, that was your your passion is um i i know that everybody out there feels it um thank you thank you for standing up for everybody for standing up and saying that this is not right um we do have some some questions that i'd like to to ask just for for all of us, um, for everyone that's watching to kind of have a better understanding of what is going on in the Congo. Um, unfortunately, particularly in the United States, um, the Congo is not really ever talked about. Um, there are several organizations that, multiple organizations that work on it, but it's, it's not um, a, day-to-day -day known of what is happening there. Um, so actually at the beginning of this year, a Genocide Watch, which is an international organization that monitors um, mass atrocities around the world, actually listed uh, the, a 
a genocide warning for the Banya Milenge in Eastern Congo. And the Banya Milenge are an, an ethnic minority. Um, Dani, uh, this question I'm gonna direct uh, to you. Um, are the Congolese authorities aware of the ongoing genocide against Banya Milenge in Eastern, Eastern Congo? Yeah, yes, yes, they are. And maybe let's say that Minembe, now where, uh, like I say, most of the killing are happening now, is kind of a remote area. And mostly the government has access there. Like non profit organizations, civil society, they don't really have access over there uh, because of the road. There's no road going over there. Uh, only in Ju June and July, when there is no uh, war, people can access with car. But for, uh, during the rain season, no way to get there. But anyway, the government get there because there is many, many um, Congolese army there. There have been generals uh, up to now in one year, they have replaced like five times generals. They send one general after a month, they will change to another one. But also, even the uh, chief of staff for president, he went there and meet with the population. They told him uh, what the killing going on. They showed him where is the Mai Mai who is killing people they come from. And in fact, between Banyamulen community in Minembe Center, they are kind of in um, five square meter miles, five square miles area where, be, uh, where is, uh, they live with Monisco, trying to protect them and Congolese government. And between them and Mai Mai, who, is, who are the killers, there is a position of the uh, Congolese army position. So when Mai Mai come to kill people and to steal their cows and, and belongings, they pass through uh, the military camp. They can see them coming. They talk to them. They have like, we, we, we have many proof that how they talk and how they plan together. They tell them, Banyamuleng are here, their cows are here. You can pass this way and attack them. You can pass this way and, um, I mean, and steal their cows. And all this shows clearly that the government, the authorities are aware. And even in Kinshasa, there is some uh, group of congressmen that they even went to president many times. They talk with army generals every time. And, but we really, a population, we don't understand why the government is not intervening. Like I, uh, maybe one, Michael, uh, my, uh, the other panelists would talk about it. Like the last uh, killing of two women, uh, in fact, they, they call the government army, the DRC army called, told the population because they don't have any other source of food except going back to their original villages and get something from their corn fields. So the army told them, come, we're gonna accompany you, go get your food. They say, okay, that's good idea. They went. Many women went with them, and unfortunately, the government army, the captain who was leading the area, called Mai Mai, say they are there. Even those women, they tried to hide, but the, the, the same uh, government soldier, they told Mai Mai, go down there, you will see them there hiding. So everything happening there, government is aware, but what we don't know is why they don't intervene. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stani. Um, I, I had a question that came in from a viewer um, wanting to know what can, what can they do to become involved to raise awareness? Um, what organization should they be looking at? How can they get involved? This can go to, to any panelist, really. Um, I don't know, maybe my uh, other panelists will say something, but uh, right now, the big help for the population in Milemwe, Banyamulengi population, is to get the government involved. It to push, is to show on uh, the international community. We know they they are somehow involved in some way or another to protect them. They need peace. In fact, if they have peace, you know, they live there for hundred and hundred years. Even they didn't even need any support, and they live like independent life. They don't live on um, government budgets. They just, they have their own life over there. If they can have peace, and if this killing can stop, otherwise, uh, another help, uh, I mean, they need this peace, they need to be heard, they need this killing to be stopped. Oh, I, uh... Amber, will you, your question again, mm -hmm. please. So we had someone watching ask, um, how can they how can they get involved? So um, how can they get into contact with with our organizations? If so, maybe if you could just talk a little bit about Hero Women Rising um, okay. briefly, and um, and. Congo American Bridge is a local one, depending upon where this person is, is from in Indianapolis, mm -hmm. um, that we, you can also get involved with Congo American Bridge, but name of these. Okay, that is really wonderful. That is a good question that they're asking. I think is how they can be involved. They can, oh, first of all, be informed, know what is going on. That is the number one, we need everyone be away where is it going on on the congo and secondly uh, you see the petition if they can sign that petition is a big help because we are asking to go to un third things we can see i like to be talk about hair women rising that's all if you can chat there and please be in touch with us and we work from there and uh, when war began, I was there. And that is not only Minembe camp. That is where women do manifest, march. But we have uh, like a three, uh, that big area, those three regions. We have a big uh, camp, UN camp, Monusco called the Monusco camp, UN peacekeeper. And when we can re request is if UN keep a not sit with people there, go. A uh, little far from where they have a uh, farm, and the people can have access to to food. Because when you ask the Monusco to to uh, uh, humanitarian aid, they say you know they don't have in mandate to transport food for people. People they are dying with hunger. But we ask them if they are they have guns, they have everything. They can go so far from a village down a little bit from where they have a, a firm and people can have access to, to food. That is, how, that is the way government and the NGOs, they can intervene, but we need really, because there is no road to bring them food or water or medicine, but we lived like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. We, have, we, have, we lived like heaven. We have everything. Food is there. And they killed those women that was going to bring the food from plantations. But is, that is where we are asking for peace because we know world, it doesn't open eyes. Everyone is, will be finished. People will be dying. But where we need, we need peace. If it does a military monusco, they can go so far not to sit on a town only. They go 
uh, uh, after uh, villages, the city there, they do camp there, and the people can have access to food. That will something. And also, really, this is a good question. If you wanted to collaborate together, you can do www.herowomenrising.org. Let, let really rising together. We are massacre, trouble, problem, but we can rise. Women always rising, you know, is it really no, no place. Women always, always rising with kids, with community, looking for food, supporting. They are on the front line. How to help those women who are on the front line? Thank you for asking that question, my dear. Thanks, Nima. Um, Ali, um, so I, you work with refugees in the, the Indianapolis area mainly, but kind of around the, the country. Um, what do you hear about the conditions within the refugee camps through your work with the Congolese refugee community in the U.S.? And what is the Congolese government doing to protect those living within the camp? Uh, thanks again for the questions. Um, first of all, uh, you need to know that uh, since 1997, Congo has now more than 5 million of people, displaced and refugees around the world. And it's like uh, the, the first country now in terms of refugees and internal places that will rebel. So we do have uh, uh, refugees around our neighbor's countries, Rwanda, Burundi, Uganda, and we do have two biggest campus in Tanzania uh, and the other one in uh, Uganda. So it is really horrible because you know that uh, people before they get to recent years, they spend at least 10, 15 years in those camps. And uh, there is not any assistance. There is not uh, access to schools. So you will see that people came here, uh, they don't uh, know how to spell their names. They don't know how to read because they've spent all their lives on the camp. So that's a big issue for refugees. So asking what governments are doing, that's a good question. Uh, for a remind, the big problem in Congo is the government. Since 1997, we don't have any stable government or a strong government. That's the reason there is those massacre of people in, in Congo, especially in Eastern Congo, because we don't have uh, a strong army. We just had uh, our general election last year. The government is a new one. We cannot accept more things from them. They, they are still learning. And unfortunately, the president, the current president is uh, from a civil, a civil uh, politics party. The, the, uh, the former government still uh, under control for everything. I mean, they are taking control of everything. And that's the reason you see there is a local militia around all the country. So for me, I would say that uh, what we can expect from this government is to work really hard to establish a national army that can protect everyone. But that thing people are missing right now. The Congolese army are not able to protect civilians that are killed every single day. And also, justice must be done in Congo. Those people who are killing, who kill people every single day, must be arrested. Because we need justice on this country. People have been doing bad things long, long time ago. No one can arrest them. That's a big problem. Which country can you build without justice? So for myself, I would say that. So we need justice. That is must be done. The second thing also, we have also, the second level is international, uh, regional level. So our neighbor's country has to help us to become also stable. We know that those weapons that we mentioned here are not from Congo. They are from neighbor's country. They take advantage of Congo, of our minerals, and they support local militia. We need to say that we don't have any 
uh, area where we made weapons in Congo, no? Everything is from outside of Congo. So that will side. That's why you have uh, those refugees come here every single day, because their territory, their village, are under control of local militia. And we know that uh, when those local militia strike control of the village, they get minerals, and the minerals are sold out of Congo. We should know where those minerals are sold and who supports them. So here in Indiana, we do have a lot of refugees uh, from Congo. Uh, so, uh, and fortunately, you know, for this administration, there, is, there was a travel ban. Uh, we do have uh, like uh, the number of refugees decreased uh, the last year. So that's really bad for people who have been uh, waiting for a long time to come here. And we don't know again uh, this year what will happen with this uh, COVID-19. But I told you it's horrible, the living condition of my brothers and uh, sister in the camp. Thank you, Ali, um, for that answer. Um, and I just want to briefly mention that you were talking about the sort of illicit mineral trade. And then I, I don't think a lot of people out there realize that those minerals um, go right into here. Um, and then we buy it and it cycles right back into continuing the violence and the um, poverty and the rape of the Congo. Um, so thank you for, for bringing that up and hopefully that raises a little bit a little bit more awareness about um, our own role in what is happening in the Eastern DRC. Um, so we're going to um, transition now a little bit and like to remember family members, friends, um, those within the Congolese community whose voices have been silenced um, due to hate and violence. And Nema, if you could please start us. I think it's really so hard to say name because is those memories is coming very fresh to us. Uh, like uh, you see back our photos, maybe I don't know if I will be able to say many name, but I have uh, those uh, women, uh, many women, Nyazaninka, uh, Francine that is i'm honored to stand up for her she passed away so fast she was 30 years old and we have a she is she was a 26 it's like my daughter she passed away without no voice after rape beat her cut her everywhere and breath also they cut everything that is really is hurting. And this like you see the photo here with me. This is my cousin. He was a really good guy. He loved to do funny things in the family. He passed away in 2018. And uh, when he passed away, when they, they killed him, they were sending us messages to say, no, he's still in the prison. And we look, whole family, we send much money. That is a big story, you can't imagine. And after they get money, the people who killed him, they say, he's died. And the Red Cross go to bring his body and the, I, I, we didn't bar him is the Red Cross, but we need, if this massacre finish, maybe we'll have his body and to bar him in, in dignity, but they're still there. It's many people, another my cousin who passed away from my village where we built this school, big school in Itombe, was for whole community. 
with that school was 250 kids they come in September to when we open a school in DRC. You can't imagine how it was, like a flower, whole village, like a kid, they have uniforms moving around. And that, that school is finished. Rebels put it down. I built a big center for women when women can have, it's like a sanctuary for women they can come and share and they cry or singing. I, I have many songs is that in that kind of our center is full memories of women. They put it down, but I'm stand up today for those women's voice. And the one old woman who was coming always our center bring us like telling us stories. And when the rebel came, they put fire. She was going on a bush and the fire because she was not see good. She was old woman and the name is Rebecca. She passed away in that bush near our women's center in Itombe Mountains. That is where we, all these names, I can't finish them, but it's really, can say, together we remember them. Together we remember all people passing from, like uh, Ali said, five million. Is it not five million? In time, colonizing time, Congo lost more 10 million people. But still today, world, no one will talk about that. That is like something you keep, that like a, is like a treasure. It's like no one who touch because the colonizing, they don't want to bring that because he asked justice. If we need justice, we need also reparation. That is the way why those, uh, uh, countries colonizing countries don't want to bring that things up because if we say justice no we need the reparation and and we need to be comfortable to accept that that is really hard to say all those names but is it in our heart we'll do or oh, next time just this is the beginning to bring little light little light to bring on the people on the mind we planted the seed and I tell them, is with us. We are talking about them, we remind them, we take action is why we stand up. From all this week, we are reminding them, we are really not, we remember them in a good way. Look how this is my cousin smile. That is the guy who passed away, but we smile with him. I really, I loved him, we miss them, but we miss also that place. We can remember them in our good way, how to remember our people who pass away. Thank you. Thank you, Neymar. Sandra, if you could please raise up uh, your names. Let us also remember Longininga, a driver. Dear Donne and Yeke, Pastor, Mulisha Joseph, Anuari Bihira Lumumba, Badi Mukandama Jamali. Thank you, Sandra. Justin, if you could please raise your names. Yes, let's remember um, Semahoro. Let's remember Bagabo, my brother Bismana, my cousin uh, Claude, and uh, my other cousin um, Rugendibonga. Thank you, Justin. Donnie. Yes, uh, help me to remember my cousin, Nezewa Kadinda. Passed away, he was killed in 1998 in Kinshasa. In fact, no one talked about them. He was in the Congolese army and they were killed on order from the former president Kabila, who was the uh, army chief of staff at that time. 
and they were in the Republican Guards, and they were killed because they just they are Banyamulenge, and uh, many of them they they were uh, burned alive. Um, let's also remember Muhindo Izebiango Jano and Dagijimana Eritje. We need peace, we need justice for those. And as Ali said, we can't have peace without justice. Thank you, Stani. Um, Ali. So first, let's remember all the human rights. We have been killed for the job. Uh, let's remember Floribe Chibea. Let's remember Armatungu. Yeah. Let's remember Paloku. Let's remember all the women killed. We have been killed this year in Beni territory. Thank you, Ali. This is Mugisho Kolandwa Augustin, who's 27. Um, he, along with 14 others, were murdered by militia just less than a week ago. We remember him. Anna, if you could please raise your, your names and tell your story. This is a picture of my parents, Rachel and Samuel. Um, let us remember them and let us remember my newborn sister who also was killed, Ray, um, Naima. Um, hi everyone, my name is Anna Tembo and I am, a, I am a survivor of the genocide of 97. Came here in America in 2000. Um, quick story, a um, few years before we were put in concentration camp, we were living normal lives. Um, my dad didn't want to believe what was happening. You would see little signals like soldiers coming in, um, randomly putting people just walking to the store into jail for how they look. Um, started to come in, take our cars, um, started taking our cows. Um, my dad didn't want to believe it. He was optimistic and was saying, okay, things are gonna blow over. Um, by then, it was too late. A couple of weeks later, our family in the middle of the night was taken by soldiers and put into camp. Our father was killed in front of us. My mother had just had a baby, was very sick. And um, my little sister unfortunately passed away. My mom became ill. Um, my, my auntie begged the soldier to get us help because my mom, you know, after Having children, you have to heal. She had a C-section, so she needed medical attention. They said she could get help. They let my aunt walk her seven miles to the nearest um, hospital. Um, unfortunately, my mom passed away there. They didn't tell us how. They don't, we don't know if they took her life or she passed away from being, from being ill, um, from having the baby. Um, and a couple months later, um, an angel by, um, and Red Cross, uh, a few people helped us get on one of the last planes. We weren't on the list um, to come to America. Um, there is a happy ending. My brothers and I um, were taken in by amazing foster parents. Um, we never forget our parents. We never forget what happened to us, but we've pushed on. We live our lives and join organizations um, to help remember what happened and keep our father's name going strong by staying in school, living our lives. Um, yeah, and just trying to be happy and move forward, so yeah. And Anna, what would you say to those who, who want to get involved? How, how, how can they do that? Um, so we all have social media, 
one thing we could start by doing is creating hashtags and um, getting the media's attention and seeing like, what is this about? Um, we could keep talking about like today, keep talking about the people we've lost and never forget what happened. Um, have people publicly share their stories like me, um, help, help by sharing our stories, it makes it help it relatable um, to everyday people in society. They can see like, this is what we're going through and um, we don't want people to forget. Um, Long-term, we can write to public officials, get their attention um, for those um, who can, as much as you can donate um, to people back home, um, just help them um, continue to live life, even though um, there's still a war going on. Um, uh, yeah. Thank you, Anna. Um, so we only have just a couple minutes left, and I would really, I would really love to hear. We, we keep talking about um, never again, never again. And as we always see, it's again and again. Um, and, and we're here today specifically to remember, but to use that remembrance and turn it into action. Um, how in just very few words, what does what does never again mean to you personally? Is it even something that we can achieve? Um, let's see, Stani, would you like to answer? <clears throat> yes. Um, uh, we, we say that it's better to do something little than just doing nothing even if we can share this uh, like today's uh, we're talking about this and you can share and sometimes the media can help to amplify the voices but uh, also is to we know that there is many um, organizations like especially U.S. organization that can have some really big voices. If you can, they can be able to amplify this voice, that will help a lot. Thank you. Um, Ali, what does Never Again kind of signify to you? So, Never Again for me mean uh, Let's stand up, everyone. We don't need to see it again the conflicts like in Congo. And for that, everyone needs to be uh, involved in these uh, issues in Congo. It's not only Congo issues, as I mentioned. Now, we need also to get involved our friends, American people, neighbors, Rwandese, Burundese, everyone must be involved. So that conflict massacre should stop in Congo. Um, in just a few words, Naima, what does what does never again signify to you? To me, never again is everyone can take action in every uh, capacity you have, and everyone can take action in it together with your heart, we remember. And uh, take action is not only to cry, but take action in your capacity and uh, never again. All right, thank you so much. Um, I believe our time um, is up, although I do actually want to ask Sandra real fast what never again means, means to you. I think never again means to me, little children not being able to live as children, to enjoy life as children. 
So never again should they be victimized and the right to be a child taken away from them. Never should women have to give their bodies un unintentionally or without their own permission. And it means never again should governments deny people the right to live as citizens, but most of all, as human beings. Wonderful. Perfectly said. Thank you, Sandra. Um, so that puts us at our time. I want to thank everyone um, who was able to join us today. Uh, our representatives from, from Congo American Bridge, from Hero Women Rising, uh, Nima, Justin, Anna, uh, Stani, Ali, Sandra, um, and of course, I have to, to thank David um, and, and Marcus with Together We Remember and for, for pulling this together, for bringing literally the world together to remember those whose lives have been lost to hatred, um, as well as to give a platform to raise up the voices who are still crying out. So um, thank you from the bottom of my heart for, for allowing us to, to be here today. Amber, thank you for all of your hard work. Thank you. All thank of you. the panelists. Um, who who joined today. Nema, thank you for sending me that email and to Kiel as well, um, saying, hey, our community is under threat. Uh, atrocities are happening, you know, let's talk. And we had that incredible phone conversation and that led to us having this conversation with people watching all over the country here in the US, but also around the world. And I'm hoping that this little bit of a platform may help in a small way and that we can continue our conversations around how we can collaborate and of course, turn that into action. So thank you everyone for joining. Um, this was a really special and meaningful uh, session as we now head into our final eight hours, the third, yeah, the, the final third of our 24 hour um, global virtual vigil uh, to end Genocide uh, Awareness Month. <laughs>